10, 9, ignition sequence start. All engines are level. Lift off, the clock is Lift off. The clock is I'm taking everyone out of their comfort zones. It's time for episode 56 of Kerbalcast. Who, what, where, why, when? I'm not familiar with the type of thing I'm seeing. I'm your LMP, that's Lunar Module Pilot, Biff Aldrin, and with me is my CMP, Command Module Pilot. Andy M. I mean, Nostromo. It's Andy M. I'm, I mean, Nostromo. And now is probably a good time to tell you that we were both telling a bit of a fib. The real Biff and the real Nos are on EVA today, and I am taking over with my friend here. I am also known as Amy K, and I will be fake Biff. And fake Nos with me is actually... Fritas. Fritas, hey, how are you today? I am excellent. How are you, Amy? I'm not bad, thanks. And you guys have uh, you guys have been celebrating 4th of July, haven't you? Yes, we have. We just... Uh celebrated our time kicking you Brits off of uh, the continent, and it's quite the party over here, I'm sure. Well, it wasn't me, so I don't mind, but I should I say Happy Fourth of July? Is that a thing? Is that a thing people say? Happy Fourth of July? Fourth of July, Independence Day, uh, the day we kick the lobster backs out, whatever, whatever works for you. All right, then. Well, Happy Lobster Day. <laughs> go with, let's go with that one. All right, so it's just you and me today, fake Nos. So what's coming up in today's program? Well, what does the expert do when nobody's watching? It's our progress in the game. Science, career, and sandbox, oh my. We furthered the discussion on the game's different modes. Audio letters galore. We've got not one, not two, but a whole bunch of audio letters and normal letters in this week's mission briefing. And finally a very special live edition of Free Toss Flight Fundamentals. Sounds like we've got a nice fun episode planned. So first kicking off, Free Toss, some, oh, I'm sorry, fake NOS. Something I've really wanted to ask you. Biff calls you an uber level player in this game. And, you know, I have to ad- agree with him. You are w- a- up there on the advanced expert side of the scale. Um, I really want to know when you play KSP and you're not, preparing like a free toss flight fundamentals or anything like that what do you do what do you like to do in the game as an expert player well it's actually kind of interesting that you say that because first i don't really consider myself to be an uber level player i know what i'm doing enough to get around but there are definitely people out there who are better than me just take a look at das well yeah (laughs) but what's interesting is Over the past few weeks, since I've started doing Flight Fundamentals, a vast majority of my playtime has in fact been research or getting stuff together or just kind of screwing around trying to find topics for you guys. And really, that's what I've, that's what I do in the game. It takes me a couple hours to get, to get ready to do Flight Fundamentals. And that's really fun for me. Uh, when I'm not doing that, I've expanded my horizons and explored new topics that I hadn't had any experience in. Things like uh, VTOL, vertical uh, takeoff and landing aircraft, I had never actually done before getting ready to cover it in a Flight Fundamentals. So So if you just use uh, Flight Fundamentals as an excuse to learn something new that you didn't actually know, but everyone just assumes that you knew? (laughs) Well, I, I very rarely go into a Flight Fundamentals blind. It's usually something that I've had interest in and feel like messing around for a little bit in the game would make me comfortable enough to discuss it in a, a flight fundamentals. But Oh yes. I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna do my job as fake Biff here and a little bit of a, a sidetrack that I've just thought of. Do you know what we're missing? Uh we're missing a coconut. Why well, we are missing a coconut? And of Coconut Co. Wilson. And we're also missing a coconut story. But do you know what really bugs me? And I, I can't believe I'm already digressing. It's filling my job as um, fake Biff. But do you know what really bugs me about Wilson? What? Do you know Wilson in Castaway was not a coconut? Of course. Wilson in Castaway is the volleyball. <laughs> Am I just being, like, really, really sh- out there? Should I just be not worrying about this sort of thing? It just... Or I, every time I'm listening to the usual episodes, I'm thinking, it's not a coconut! Wilson's not a coconut! Well, Or is that just me? 
<laughs> I think it's okay because even though Wilson in the movie is the volleyball that Tom Hanks befriends, uh, it the coconut that Nas and Biff have adopted as their mascot serves the same purpose. It's a small, round, inanimate object that they've become that has become a sort of new character. So it fulfills the same purpose and it's in the same style. But you're right in that it is a volleyball, not a coconut. So I'm just nitpicking. All right. Anyway, back to what we were talking about. I'm really sorry that. Oh, it's um, fine. After all, you are fake Biff. I am fake Biff and you are fake Nas. So fake Nas. What have you been up to this week then? So uh, this week, as we're recording this now on the 7th of July, uh, is Shark Week uh, for fans of the Discovery Channel like myself. And so would you believe it that I spent a couple hours yesterday building a flying shark in KSP? And not only that, but it was a single stage to orbit, and it worked on it the first try that I took it off the runway. And a flying shark. A flying shark. Uh, and if you follow me on Twitter, I, I tweeted out a couple pictures of it. Uh, I'm sure that we'll include a couple links in this episode's uh, show notes. I might even give you guys the craft file. But Please tell me you named it Jaws. I named it Air Jaws. <laughs> Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, and I I even uh covered well not the one that I have the pictures of, but I went and covered the the top portion of it with all of the the surface mounted solar panels to make it look blue, uh like a great like I colored like a great white shark. Yeah. And oh, I can't wait to see this. <laughs> oh, it's it's pretty glorious. Uh, the problem with it though is that a shark isn't aerodynamic. A shark is hydrodynamic, and they're not actually... The shape of a shark isn't the best for a plane because it's not aerodynamically stable. Uh, so what you're essentially saying here, I'm breaking it down, obviously putting it into finer points, because you are an expert and I am not an <laughs> expert. Right. What you're basically saying is a shark is not the same as a space plane. It is not, but I managed to get it to work anyway through sheer thrust capabilities. The problem is that right. the, the only lift surfaces uh, that are horizontal on a shark are the pectoral fins, which uh, are really far forward. And as I've said in Flight Fundamentals many times, in order to be aerodynamically stable, the center of lift has to be behind the center of mass. And because... The, the lifting surfaces are so far forward, uh, I can get into space by just ramming a lot of thrust into it and flying as fast as I can, but it's it doesn't want to land. It, uh, it tumbles through the air and heats up and explodes and dies, and the shark gets uh, barbecued on the way down. This is absolutely fascinating. Who would have thought, like, you could tune into a show about Kerbalcast, essentially about space, and listen to barbecuing sharks? <laughs> exactly. Uh, just like you might hear hear talking about badgers or other strange animals, coconuts. Ah, you did it. You did it. You finally <laughs> said badger. What do you now, mean, I'm gonna, finally? I'm going to let... I'm going to let, uh, I don't think Biff and Noss know this either. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to let the listeners know. Fritos was originally, oh, fake Noss, sorry. <laughs> fake Noss was originally on this show for the first time, uh, oof, it was a month or two ago now, wasn't it? Uh, it was immediately after the release of 1.0. Okay. And just before he went on with the real Biff and Noss, I said that he had to, somewhere in there, say the word badger. And he forgot. So I've been bugging him to say Badger at some point during Kerbalcast, uh, be it Free Toss, Fly Fundamentals, or whatever, for ever since then, and he's finally done it. You finally got the Badger in. I'm impressed. Well, fake Biff, do me a favor, and when we're done recording this, go back and listen to my Fly Fundamentals on Rendezvous that I made specifically for you. Uh, and I listened to it. Well, give it a listen again, and you might be surprised by what you hear. Really? Was there a badger in there that I missed? I can't believe it. I've been waiting all this time for a badger <laughs> listening to your FFS, and I missed the badger when it came. Yes, <sighs> I did. I did put it in the Rendezvous episode. Oh, dear. Anyway, um, back to Kerbal. Right. <laughs> and off badgers. Uh, a question I, another question I wanted to ask you. 
Is there anything in the game that you haven't yet done that you've wanted to do? Oh, of course. So I was saying earlier, I was saying earlier that I didn't really consider myself to be that uber of a player like uh, fake Biff and real Biff have been giving me credit for. And a big reason for that is I haven't done everything. Biff has gone farther and to more places than I have been. I The only moon of Jewel that I've landed on is Lathe. I haven't gone to Drez. I haven't landed and returned successfully from Moho or Eve or even Elu. So there's still quite a few places that I haven't been. And I mostly chalked that up recently uh, to me getting my enjoyment out of the game doing things for Flight Fundamentals, which has mostly been building experimental aircraft to fly around on Kerbin, which is still a ton of fun, but I haven't gotten around to uh, completing a grand tour of the solar system in career mode, which, if you had asked me before I started doing uh, Flight Fundamentals, that would have been my goal. Uh, but my focus has changed a little bit, and I'm actually going to be getting back to things like that uh after this very special episode of Flight Fundamentals, I'm going to actually be covering extraplanetary uh, aircraft. So that'll give me a reason to leave the Kerbin system once again and take things with wings to places like Eve, Duna, and Lathe and uh, give you guys some tips on how to make them perform well there. Okay, so you don't consider yourself that advanced of a player, do you? I think that... I have the theoretical side pretty well handled in my head. Um, I have enough experience in the game, and I'd like to think that I know enough about things like physics to be able to tackle any challenge that I come up against with at least some degree of forethought. But no, I haven't done everything, and there are definitely people who are better out there than I am. Uh, so, so what would it need? What would it take for you to consider yourself? A advanced level player what would you need to do before you said all right okay i am an advanced player well there are three things that i think or have heard are the most difficult things to do in kerbal space program uh the first is to successfully build a space shuttle replicant that is as accurate as possible and functional and we'll be covering that a little bit later in flight fundamentals Ooh. Um, but uh, the other two are to successfully return soil samples from Eve and from Tylo. Eve is, of course, difficult and real Biff's arch nemesis because of its extreme gravity and super thick atmosphere. And I think I... Eve is many people's <laughs> arch nemesis. Right. And Tylo is similarly because it has the same mass and size just about as Kerbin, but it doesn't have an atmosphere. So you still have to burn a lot of fuel to land uh, with because you don't have an atmosphere to help you slow down. So if I can, if I can, I've already accomplished the space shuttle. So that's one of the three. Uh, if I can get the other two down, which I haven't really even attempted, uh, then I would consider myself at that point to be a more complete player. I'm sure it won't take you that long until you're there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see if I have time between uh, episodes of Flight Fundamentals. Okay, one more thing. I was uh, well, I was going to speak to be, uh, Real Biff and Real Noss about, but now you're here, I'm going to speak to you about it. Recently, Biff and Noss have been talking about the science mode and career mode and whether there's actually a need for science and career in the game now. What What's your take on that? So... I definitely agree that each of the three modes has their place, has a style of player or a type of player that would prefer them uh, over the others in certain situations. I definitely agree with Nas that there are some players who want the guidance that career mode gives, that want the uh, that want the ability to get missions to accomplish and have specific goals and ways to progress and feel like you're uh, getting farther in the game. At the same time, I understand Biff's opinion that sandbox mode 
gives you what you need and that it's easier to learn new things in Sandbox uh, as long as you're not overwhelmed by the number of parts and things and have some idea of what things do. Because what about science? What about science mode though? Because surely science mode is just a trimmed down version of Korea. So I I am of the belief that a very very first time player should be in science mode and not in career. And the reason that I say that is because the restrictions that are given on you in career mode, while while applicable to someone who's familiar, not being able to do things like maneuver nodes or target vessels um, if you haven't upgraded the tracking station or mission control. They add a fun gameplay element if you know what you're doing, but imagine trying to go to the Mun or Min Miss for the very first time and not being able to set it as your target or not being able to plan a maneuver node I think that, that that restriction makes it makes the early game unnecessarily difficult if you're a brand new player. I think that it helps scale the difficulty and keep things interesting if you're if you know what you're doing and are a regular player, but if you're brand new, I think that science mode is the way to go. And I think that there are regular players that would still prefer science mode uh over career or sandbox. But career mode now has difficulty options where you can set it to easy, normal, hard, etc. And in those, you can toggle all the different options. So what I was thinking was essentially, couldn't science mode be replaced by career mode in easy and then toggle funds on and off? Because if you, if you toggle funds off and you, to- and you toggle upgradable buildings off, you've essentially got science mode. So, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a while since I've gone in and looked at all of those settings. Are you sure that you can toggle funds completely off? No, you can't. I'm saying that if you did, that would be the equivalent of science mode. So if squad had those two options, they could completely remove science mode. And maybe if they were off by, if they were there and off by default on easy mode in Korea, then what we now know as science mode would just be Korea easy mode. And then you just have sandbox in Korea. Uh, I don't think that that's entirely necessary or the right way to go, because if you, if you toggle off upgradable buildings and funds, then strategies doesn't really have, the administration building doesn't really serve a purpose. And well, strategies as well. I just mean everything that makes Korea Korea. If you toggled those off on the difficulty settings, then it, obviously if they were there, then that would be science mode. So would it be worth imp- like incorporating science mode into a subset of career mode? I'm so, I suppose I just don't under, uh, see the point in doing that because then you've just turned it into science that there's no there's no difference between what you've described as easy mode career and regular science mode. I'm not exactly. sure I'm not I'm not sure that that serves a purpose and that that's it's it's worth squad's time to code that and then just remove science mode. I think we are, I I think I think we already have that it's just a matter of semantics on what you call it. Oh yeah, of course. I agree and that and I I don't think it's worth squad's time either. I was just nitpicking and I just thought essentially a science mode is just tweaked career. But to, uh, one thing I did think, or a new mode that I, I know a few people have written in and mentioned before in the past, is I think a story mode would go really well into Kerbal. Uh, I think that I'm I'm actually on the fence about this. Because, really? Why? Because the whole point of Kerbal Space Program, at least when I started playing, uh, which was like the first update that career mode was actually put into the game was when I first started playing KSP was you always sort of picked your own goals and and worked your own way through it. I think that story mode would be pretty hard to implement in a way that still gave you freedom. I like being able to go in and choose what missions to go accomplish. Uh, And you can kind of write your own story as you go along. Say my first Mun landing attempt in a career save, I crash and kill my Kerbals, and I have revert settings turned off. I can make that a story in my head. I'm not sure that it would be feasible to add that in as a game mode, where the story is directly 
directly affected by your actions, but at the same time you want it to be open-ended and not be pigeonholed, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah. That's just, that's just my take on it. I, th I think that it would be a lot of work on Squad's part for something that I don't think would add that much to the game. I think that things like um, upgrading the Unity engine would what uh would be more worth their time at the moment maybe maybe way way down the road but i don't think that it would add a whole lot to my personal experience i'll admit i'm also split on this i can see the i can see the pros of what people say and ignoring the fact that you know squad of better things to work on but story mode as a principle i think it would be it would be good to try and the people who like to go through that it would give more of a a purpose to the casual game and someone who isn't who is less inclined to play sandbox and have their own personal goals and the characters of the Kerbals just lend themselves to having stories but at the same time I think once you went over that bridge or I think that would put a lot uh, a very limited lifespan of shelf time on uh, KSP if it was put in so I can see both sides I can see the point of the people who want it and the point of the people who don't but regarding what you said about Unity, I would much prefer that because I don't know if it's tied in, but I've had a lot of problems playing KSP on my Mac recently. Um, not so many in 0 0.90, but in 1.0, almost it crashes almost all the time. And I don't know if that's that Unity will improve that or not, but it's really unstable on the Mac. Well, we'll see. I... I don't play on a Mac. I don't know anybody besides you who does. So oh, I oh, oh. Hmm? And on Twitter this week, I saw someone who had KSP on a Mac. I, I forget who it was off the top of my head right now, but I commented on it. And so there is at least one other Kerbal out there in <laughs> the ether playing on a Mac. All right. Uh, well, I suppose that that's a decent enough transition into your progress in the game, if you've made any, besides your technical issues. Um, due to my technical issues, I've had very little progress in the game, but I ha I can say that I have been, uh, and this is really bad to admit to it, definitely to you, fake NOS, but I have still been trying really hard to make a monstrosity that will take me to Jewel without rendezvous. <laughs> because it's just evil. Uh. It's the most <laughs> evil thing in the world. And I think rendezvous should just become physically impossible so nobody has to do it. Have you practiced? Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not my fault. That's because it keeps crashing. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using that as my get-out-of-jail-free card and my, you know monstrosity building well i built a monstrosity that got to duna without rendezvous so i keep trying but so far i haven't come anywhere close and when it's a little more i've installed ksp on windows now because it's it's much more stable on there so i've put it on my boot camp and i'm hoping to be able to practice a bit more with rendezvous because it's there's nothing more annoying than lining things up pa un pausing and unpausing uh, flight fundamentals, pausing, unpausing, doing a little bit more, pausing, unpausing, and then crash and I lose it all. It is so infuriating that I just figured, you know what, until it's not going to crash anymore, I'm just going to keep doing my weird thing. Uh, I have a question for you, uh, fake, fake Biff. When yes, you, fake when you, when you, when you, when you've tried this, have you, have you gotten, have you successfully rendezvoused? Is it the docking that you're having trouble with? Can you get your two craft within a half a kilometer of each other? I can, well, I can get them so that they can see each other. But I, I don't think, I don't think I've got within half a kilometer now. <laughs> uh, well. I can't get the same orbit twice. No two orbits of mine are identical, which just, you know, makes it even harder. Because one will be, um slightly elliptical and then another will be either perfectly uh round or a little bit elliptical in the wrong way and it's just oh i can't do the same orbit twice i don't know what it is there's a uh, random element well i suppose the best tips that i can have for you unfortunately are still buried in in that episode of flight fundamentals that i gave uh i think that if you go back and listen again i know this is going to 
sound like a broken record. And follow the steps. It's not the most, it's not the fastest way to get a rendezvous, but it is the 100%. If you follow the steps correctly, uh, you will, you will get them very close to each other. You, you have to be precise. You have to be, uh, patient with it and make sure that you're in as close to a circular orbit as you can on both craft and then be patient and watch uh, time warp until that you get your closest approach really close and then when you when you do your maneuver nodes you know get them get them as close to the you know 0.0, .0 meters per second left on that little progress bar to the right of the nav ball it's annoying it I'll, I sound like a broken record but you really just have to practice with it and I will. It's, I, it's, I will. It's, it, it's like that with everything that you're that that was once everything that was once hard that you now think is easy was once hard. So this will become one of those things. And I have faith in you, Amy. You'll, uh, oh, you'll, thank you'll, you. you'll 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 get you'll get there and then you'll be able to go to Jewel and beyond. I will get it done. I'll get it done. Um, so to basically sum up, I need to keep practicing, go back, re-listen. Follow the steps. Oh, it sounds very deep, isn't it? Go back, re-listen, follow the steps, find the hidden badger, and you will eventually make it. Exactly. That is your quest. Find the hidden badger. Okay, and with that, I think we can move on to the mission briefing. All right, sounds good. First stage expended. Second stage. The mission briefing. And welcome back to Mission Briefing, uh, where we've got a whole bunch of your letters today. So, kicking it off with Fake Nos, what have you got for us first? Well, first, it's actually not a letter, it's a bit of news. Apparently, All right, okay. apparently Kerbal Academy has hit over 10,000 subscribers. They're now sitting Ooh. at the time of uh, this letter at 10,009 subscribers, and our subreddit ranked 3,316. So, congratulations to them. Woohoo, congratulations. That's, uh, that's quite a lot. <laughs> All right, and uh, okay, I'll, after that, I have a letter here from Job Rock. Hmm, interesting name. He says, Hello, Kerbalcast team. I can't sleep. It's around half past five in the morning, and I was browsing into the internet when I came upon this list of sci fi books and one fantasy book. I hope they'll make a good addition to the Kerbal Podcast Book Club. Over to your mobile. And P.S., do you think Kerbals crash so often because they're reading great sci-fi? Well, I have to admit, I've never actually seen a Kerbal reading a book in KSP, so I doubt it. But I've I've had a look at this list here, and a couple of them I've read. I'll put this link in the show notes, but um, The Wind-Up Girl I've heard of, but I've never read. I think that's a kind of steampunky one. The Martian's on there, which has got a lot of... Um, airtime on Kerbalcast in the last few weeks. Have, have you read The Martian? Uh, I have. I have not read uh, The Martian or many other uh, sci-fi fantasy books. I prefer high fantasy, right? Uh, but I suppose I'll have to put uh, The Martian at least on the list so that I can read it before uh, the movie comes out. Yeah, you have to. You have to read The Martian. It's absolutely fantastic. What else is on this list? Nineteen eighty four is on the list. I wouldn't really call nineteen eighty four sci fi, though, would you? Not really. It's more like just dystopian. Let's comment on government. Mm, I'm not sure I'd call that sci fi, but I'll I'll put this list in the show notes. Fake Nos, what have you got for us next? All right, next up we have a letter from Felmite. Dear Fake Biff and Fake Nos. Did you really say Firstly, that? No, it did not really say that. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Biff and Nos, Firstly, very glad to hear that you are now enjoying career mode. I think it's a, been a fantastic addition to the game. For rescue of Kerbal missions, all Kerbals, including Taurus, on the ship should get experience based on what they accomplish, orbiting the Mun, landing on Minmus, etc. No idea why Valentina isn't leveling up for you, Biff. I'm glad that you're enjoying flying as well. Did you ever try building planes in .90 after installing FAR? The new aerodynamics in 1.0 have made flying so much more fun, mainly because landing is actually realistic and possible now, 
nosing up to slow your vertical descent never had enough desired effect in point nine zero before, in my opinion. Biff, you said that you had no idea what you'd do after career. For me, I'm almost to the unlocked everything and upgrade all the buildings in my 1.0 career. And if the game isn't giving me interesting end game contracts, I plan on restarting career mode on hard difficulty and using the Kerbal Construction Time mod to increase the challenge. That way, I'll be able to simulate missions to ensure I haven't made a grave engineering error on my rocket design. But with the added challenge of no quick saves, no reverts, and permanent Kerbal death, not to mention time required to construct a ship, which will make for some time constraints for a career mode contract much tighter. Once I am satisfied that the ship is capable of performing the mission, I'll launch and whatever happens, happens. Which brings me to your question about career mode strategies. I found lots of success simply not choosing any strategy, as I don't like the trade-offs. In my new career, though, I expect to use reputation-based strategies to get better contracts and to recover from the higher expect higher expected number of curable casualties. This week in my career, I finally experienced a mission-critical part failure with the Dang It mod. I sent out a ship to capture and land a Class A asteroid on Kerbin. I get out to a 15 million meters and rendezvous and claw it in, but I don't have enough Delta V to get home. So I burn to get it into a 15 million by 9 million meter orbit. I send up a second ship to refuel it, rendezvous, fill the tank, and the engine on the first ship had failed after I had already deorbited the refueler. I don't have any engineers to fix it, so I sent up a third ship which had an engineer and some extra spare parts. Rendezvous, but my engineer was only level 2. I hadn't yet returned any Kerbals from an interplanetary mission. Frustrated, I sent up a fourth mission to exit Kerbin's sphere of influence with my engineer and a bunch of hitchhikers to level them up, going into a solar orbit, reversing thrust, and landing them back on Kerbin. Sending a fifth mission to the asteroid with my level 3 engineer, rendezvous, EVA, and fix the engine belt. Conduct an, an inspection. The engine is in terrible shape, and the coolant line, gimbal, etc. need servicing. And I forgot to bring more spare parts this time. Oh well, let's wing it and hope it holds. Fire the engine, burn retro, and the engine fails. Now I have a 7.5 million by 10.5 million orbit, and I'll need to race up to the ship before I accidentally get a MUN encounter, and who knows what'll happen then. Suffice to say, I got frustrated and closed down the game. Also, my funds are dangerously no low now. Fun times. Fly fast, fly hard, fly far. Felmite. Thank you, Felmite. And I want to ask you something, Fagnos. I know you play with lots of mods, but and you generally play in Korea, don't you? Or is it Sandbox you uh, play in? I generally play in Sandbox now, um, because it's just easier to test things out for flight fundamentals. But I do enjoy and will play Korea from time to time as well. Okay. Right, so moving swiftly on, because we have a mountain of these to get through. Isn't it great when loads of people write in, because it feels like it's a real community show, doesn't it? Yes, especially when they're not writing into us. Yes, yes. I, I wonder if they had all these lofty ambitions of having their letters read out by the real Biff and real Noss, and they were hoping for it all week and going, Biff and Noss are going to read my letter, Biff and Noss are going to read my letter, and it gets there, and it's just you and me, and they're like, oh, right, well, I, I don't want you to read my letter now, you know, you, you guys can just go away. <laughs> Well, we apologize in advance. <laughs> we're sorry, we're not real, but we're, we're doing our best to be fake. I don't know if that makes sense, but, you know, I said it, so. Anyway, next letter! Our next letter comes from Kickspray. Hi, gang, I figured out how to build a plane because of Free Toss's Flight Fundamentals. Ooh, you're popular here. Hmm. Apparently. It took, mm, it took a few sittings because I was missing control surfaces. Frustrating. In true Kerbal fashion, on the time walk, back, time warp back to the runway, I made a few adjustments, the last of which caused the thing to explode spontaneously. No worries, though. With the capsule intact, my Kerbinaut EVA'd and used the jetpack to land safely. Observation below 18,000 meters, done. Keep up the good work. Kick spray. So, you... He managed to build a plane because of free toss flight fundamentals, but apparently 
Fritos 5 Fundamentals has yet to explain to people how to not explode. Are you planning on covering that? I'm pretty sure I've covered several ways to not explode, but there are always more ways to explode than to explain how not to explode. Uh, but yes, having control surfaces on your plane is a good idea. Although we did manage to get the Amy plane without any control surfaces. So oh, the Amy plane. The Amy, the Amy <laughs> plane was absolutely legendary. Um, this was my first ever plane. I was playing in Korea and I had a very, very limited amount of parts with no, practically, I don't think there was any control surfaces. And Freetox took any. it. Yeah, Freetox took it upon himself to somehow get this plane into the air with no control surfaces. And it was really ugly and it was really hard to control, but you, you did it. You, you figured out how to put a few things together and make it fly. I have a question. Do you, when you're bored around the house at home, do you just pick up random things and just make them fly? Uh, no, because I'm not magic. I don't think I could make a stapler fly if I wanted to. You're very close. I'm pretty sure you could like, get a lampshade, a, a table, like uh, a remote control, and it, it'll, you know, it'll go into orbit. <laughs> Maybe. If I can get a shark into orbit, I'll, I'm sure I can get a lampshade into orbit. See? Uh, anyway, our next letter comes from Acronymous. Hello again. I finally managed to track the crashes from my last letter down. With help, though. I always run out of RAM, which is pretty annoying. I then removed a few mods, and now it works flawlessly. I initially was against a release on consoles, but after thinking about it, and after the newest episode, I came to the result that there is no downside, except for maybe a split in the community. Also, while listening to you two talk about coconuts, my dad came home, and guess what he brought with him? Not one, but two cans of coconut milk. It was a pleasant surprise. Home to your mobile, Acronymous. Coconut milk so, is absolutely horrible. <laughs> oh, I don't think I've ever had it, to be honest. I suppose I'll have to put that on my list, especially after appearing on uh, Kerbalcast like this. Well, how, and, okay, speaking of which, the letter, how, how do you actually feel about it coming out on consoles? Uh, I'm totally fine with it. Uh, I basically agree with most people who wrote in last week, saying that it's not a huge deal, They've uh, they've sent out the work to another studio, so I don't think Squad is gonna be negative. Like I don't think they're gonna lose any progress on the on the PC version because they're busy working on the console. I only th I think that however many people can get into KSP is a good thing. Uh, so I agree with the real Nos on that point. So I think it. I think adding a new platform for it can only be a good thing in the long run. I have no negative things to say about it coming out on a PS4, and I have a PS4 and may get it myself, but I am i have absolutely no idea how they're going to translate the complexities of it onto a console. I mean, think about adding maneuver nodes. Think about all the subtle things that you've got to do in the game, which you need a full keyboard, etc. for. How are they going to translate that just to a single controller? I have no idea, but I'll be interested <laughs> to find out. And just um, just going back to that letter one more time, the RAM problem. I think the RAM problem is what was wrong with my Mac. I know there's a four gigabyte limit for a, a KSP at the moment, but on a Mac, for some reason, it can't go much past 2.5 before it crashes. And the base game with no mods installed is about runs at about two gig. So you put anything else in there on a Mac, and it's 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 pretty likely to explode in true KSP yeah. fashion. Yeah, and now you know why we're all so excited about the Unity update, which will hopefully raise that limit and at least set the ball in motion for uh, a 64-bit version, which will let you use as much RAM as your computer has available to it. Have they said anything else about when or if they're going to do the Unity update in KSP? Uh, as far as I'm aware, that's what the major update is going to be for 1.1. Ooh. As far as, as as far as I'm aware, so they're working on it now. It's been in the dev notes. Ooh, that should be exciting. Anyway, moving right along, I have another letter from North Star. It's been a while since we've heard from North Star. And let's see. Hi, Biff and Nos, or Fake Biff and Fake Nos, as we are today. North Star here, reporting from North California. Not North, North California, North Carolina. See, and this is what happens when you're not America, and all the states just. <laughs> 
Is no is Carolina even a state? Is California a state or am I just completely messing with something now? California is a state and North Carolina and South Carolina are separate states. There is no just Carolina. Oh, you see, that's why you need an American around when you're reading an American letter. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, North Star. I'm reporting from North Carolina. Some time ago, there was discussion on your program of how impossible direct rendezvous without passing orbits to phase into position was. I thought I'd just let you guys know that just now, for at least the third or fourth time in my Kerbal career, maybe the fifth or sixth, I managed to do just that while Kerbaling waiting for dinner after a day flying and at the beach, actually. Flying? I wonder if that means he actually flies. Anyway, sorry, Neil Star. Uh, the trick is to make a very shallow ascent and to gain an intuitive sense of when you need to launch based on your ascent profile. Once you get the hang of it, it's really not as hard as it seems. All right, got to run to dinner. Have fun, guys. North Star. Okay. Um, I do like that he's got his priorities right. A little bit on <laughs> um, KSP, a little bit on science. Then it's time for dinner, so see ya. <laughs> <laughs> yes, something like that. And... Uh, I believe that what North Star is referring to is uh, being able to rendezvous without circularizing first. Mm. Which I could really do with... Which, just launching straight off from the surface of, say, the Mun without circularizing. Uh, it is certainly possible, and I hope that I'm interpreting what he wrote correctly. Um, but, see, there is there are people out there who still know things that I don't, and North Star is certainly one of them. He's taught me a few things uh, while I've watched him on Steam a couple times. So he's he's up there, too, in the uh, skill level. Oh, yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah. I, I've watched him on um, Steam as well, and he's he's really good. Just like you, you're really good, and Nuss is really <laughs> good. There's that elite level of player that are quite impressive. All right, let's get to our next letter, which is from Renz. Hi, Biff and Noss, or Fake Biff and Fake Noss. Here are my thoughts as I listen to episode 55. If this sounds disjointed at any point, that's because I'm typing while still listening to the episode. First of all, I ran into the same issue about leveling up Kerbals. Apparently, they get experience for every sphere of influence they visit, one for orbiting, one for landing. That's one star per celestial body. At least, that's what I've deduced on my own Kerbals so far. I might be a bit off because they haven't gone very far. See below for why. The career strategy I use, I love career, and only ever play sandbox when my six-year-old son is managing the space program, is the outsourced R&D strategy. Then, once I get that set up, I only take contracts that pay out lots of funds and use a lot of space plane flights to gain a lot of science. So, whenever I can unlock a new science instrument, I pack it on a space plane, load the plane with a pilot and a scientist, roll around the KSC to do measurements near all of the buildings, free science, woot, and then fly to all of the biomes and take more measurements. Then I land it back at the KSC runway, recover the craft, and get lots of science for only the cost of my fuel. Because of the high payouts, this gets me enough funds to do whatever I want and bleeds in some science in the meanwhile. I tried tourist contracts for a while, but found that this would only be a good source of extra income if I was already planning to do a mission that fit their itinerary. Launching a whole ship for just a tourist is usually only about cost neutral, which means that all I'd earn is reputation. Honestly, I still don't really get what that is for, anyway. Anyway, got to go listen to Velvety Milk's letter now. Just keep flying, Renz. Have you noticed how popular... Uh, caffeine rage is that every, all the listeners writing in now are suggesting names for him. He's developing a little fan club, isn't he? <laughs> uh, he is. I I just can't wait to have uh, caffeine rage and DK have a uh, have a voice. Oh off. wow! Can you imagine? <laughs> Biff and Nas, if you're listening, try and make it happen. You you wouldn't even care what they were saying, would would you? They just could just be. Speaking complete gibberish, and you just be like, wow, listen to the voices. Anyway, that's completely off topic, isn't it? Sorry. I see, I'm really <laughs> fulfilling my role as fake Biff. Picking I guess up so. the least wow. relevant parts of a letter and just <laughs> running off with it. All right, what's our next letter? Right, next we have a letter from, oh, is it Misha or Micah? I'm going to say. Micah, and I am prepared to be wrong. 
Anyway, my Kamisha says, Hey guys, as always, I should have listened for another five minutes before writing that first email. Have you noticed that everybody seems to write letters before they actually finish listening to the show? I wonder uh, why that is. Well, I think... I tend to do that sometimes, but usually it's with my tweets. I, I tend to live tweet as I as I listen <laughs> to the podcast. Uh, but I usually wait to finish before actually writing in a real letter. I, I, it's just fascinating. It's like, must communicate thoughts now. Biff has said something really stupid. Or Nos has said something really funny. Or, you know, it's, it, it's, it's interesting that we... Well, not we, but real Biff and real Nos. Um... <laughs> pull out that sort of intensity anyway um i went a bit off track there didn't i back to the letter most of my comments regarding science mode were comprehensively obsoleted shortly after i hit the play button again c'est la vie so on to your other question to the listeners what is my favorite career strategy funds specifically the fundraising campaign so far, I've not found a use for reputation. I always end up with loads, no matter what I do. You know, I've had the same problem. I, well, I don't know if you call it a problem. I just... Reputation is so pointless. I just don't care about it, because there's abso- it makes absolutely no difference, unless I'm missing something. Does it make a difference? Uh, I think it affects what, uh, what missions you're offered from the mission control. But is I do it? tend to agree. I, I think that is it. Uh, so I do tend to agree in that whenever I play career, I usually do um, turning both fun, extra funds and reputation into science because I find that mm. the most useful of the three currencies. Okay, I'm um, back to the letter again. I also find it's fairly easy to get loads of science. Just do a mon or minmus flyby in the early game, for example. It's fun to plot a free return trajectory. It only takes around 4,000 meters per second of delta V from launch to landing. The, that funds... The, the funds almost always lags behind science. Also, I play with parts and lot costs, so that adds some funds drain. Oh, I just can't speak today. Also, <laughs> I play with parts and lot costs, so that adds a funds drain on top of the standard building unlocks, crew hire costs, and finally, actually building and flying stuff. My main aim is to save up the funds needed to run my own missions, usually by building up huge orbiting stations. Keep up the great work, Misha Mica. Um. <laughs> I also play with, um, you know, part unlock costs and crew hire costs, etc., etc. But that's just, you know, just the thing that I do. But I'll admit, funds have not been an issue for me since we went to 1.0. It was a lot more difficult to get funds in 0.90. I think they're uh, a lot I, more forgiving now. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think, like I said earlier, uh, I tend to go get as much science as possible just to unlock parts. I I agree that I don't think that funds are that big of an issue. Maybe it's just because I tend to try and recover as much as I can of my of my ships to try and get the maximum refund. Um but I don't I don't tend to find funds to be that hard to come by since 1.0. Mm. Which I I think that's a good thing because it really did slow down and make the early game a lot more tedious in Korea. So I'm glad they've done that. Right, especially having to unlock the buildings, which were such big chunks of funds that you Oh, needed. yeah. Mm. Right, so well, what have we got next, Fagnos? Uh, next is a letter from Stephen D. Hi, guys. I made my first Minmus landing last night with a probe while waiting for the SpaceX launch. Congratulations. That's a great, uh, great accomplishment. Minmus uh, can be difficult to get to. Uh, back to the letter. After much listening to your podcast and a crew of two stuck on the MUN, I used girders to set the landing legs nice and wide for x symmetry. Nos, I hope you've stopped thinking 3x will work better, or at all. The payload was only a mystery goo and temperature gauge slapped on the outside of the probe unit. Amy, are you listening? Because setting those uh, landing legs far away from your landers will give you a nice wide base and help prevent kettlebell mode landings. Oh, oh, yeah, kettlebell mode landings. You mean on its side? <laughs> on its side, on its head, anything but the legs. It uh, didn't explode, though. It didn't explode. All right, back to the letter. Orbit achieved, inclination matched, and counter trajectory, minmus orbit, landing. The only issue thus far is no service bay with batteries, so I have had to wait for the bright side of minmus to launch with temperature log and mystery goo data aboard. 
Why transmit when you can wait for it? Land on carbon with no parachutes. Yes, I had been thinking that I was never going to make the error, but I found myself with a tough decision. A. Separate and pray that the probe finds water and survives, or B. Re-enter with a 909 poodle fully lit to try and slow down enough for the payload to survive. Turns out that my decision to go with B was correct. Impact was less than 100 meters per second. The engine and tank exploded on impact, bouncing the payload back into the air. The heat shield protected the advanced SAS module, uh, octagon drone head, and the science. Mission accomplished in true Kerbal fashion. Duna, I'm coming for you, with a parachute this time, though. Keep up the good work, and homer to your mobile. Finally made it to that reference. Stephen D. So... Okay. I Is it just I me? Go on. Uh, so, landing like that without a parachute is certainly possible, especially if you have an engine with enough fuel to try and suicide burn. If you can get under 100 meters per second, as long as you have a couple explodable parts to be your, your cushion as you land, like your engine and a couple fuel tanks, I say go for it. At worst, quick save and you can try again. Can you explain a suicide burn to me? So, a suicide burn is when you wait as long as possible before you light your engines and you th and you throttle them up to full power and try and come to a hover right at the surface of whatever body you're trying to land on. Right. And it's it's called a suicide burn because if you don't time it correctly, then you're going to hit the surface <laughs> Boom. because you don't slow down enough. Uh and suicide burns are nice though because they also happen to be the most e fuel efficient way to land if a little risky, but What's uh, what's a little Kerbal without living on the edge? Exactly. I wish I had um, his luck, though. I wish I could land, or well, if not land, not explode every time I forget to put on a parachute or my parachute fails. I've not once successfully done anything but explode without a parachute, so I'm, I'm quite jealous. <laughs> or try some wings. Um, also, quick tip for you, Stephen. If you go to Duna, if you bring a Kerbal, make sure you bring an Engineer because you'll be able to repack the parachute, which you can use to help you slow down and land on Duna, and then use the same parachute if you repack it uh, back to Kerbin. But you need to make sure that you have a Engineer Kerbal in order to repack the parachute. Otherwise, you'll need to put on a second one. Well, that's a good or tip. More. I want to steal that tip. <laughs> All right, go for it. Right, okay, so should we move on to another letter? Of course, you're up. And our next letter also happens to be from Stephen D. He says, Biff and Noss, thank you for your public service. I would say nine-tenths of my mad skills have come from listening to your podcast, and for that, I thank you. I'm now so lost in current and catch-up episodes that I'm not sure if I'm referring to something current or 25 episodes ago. Either way, when you've talked through Rendezvous, I've listened, and now I can do it. Oh, I'm so jealous. Story goes... <laughs> I signed up for a space station contract a few weeks back, but didn't really have the science to do what I wanted with it. So I worked on that and finally went for the KSS last night while listening and watching Latour. P.S. Check out the crash from that stage three. It was a doozy. What's Latour? Do you know what Latour is? Uh, the Tour de France, I assume. Oh, the Tour de France. Yeah, I'm not just, I'm just not used to it being called Latour. I've heard of Tour de France. Anyway, back to the letter. It took around two hours for me to realise that I would need to put the KSS up in three stages. The sequence for two hours was launch, find out it's too top heavy, explode, revert. Once my mind was set on rendezvous, I went through building a smaller payload, one hitchhiker instead of three, and hopefully a more cost-effective launch vehicle, with the initial module in orbit and oriented to neutralise axes. Axes? I think he means axes. As described by someone on your podcast... I sent the next module up, Biff. Remember step four? Switch to target and zero relative speed. It's okay, we knew you were thinking it. In Amy K fashion... Oh, I'm, I'm really interested to see what Amy K fashion is supposed to be. In Amy K fashion, I proceeded to... Oh, no. <laughs> In Amy K fashion, I proceeded to up a bit, down a bit, back a bit, forward a bit, and rotate a bit. I'm never going to live that down, am I? <laughs> oh, dear. Until I remembered to put the stupid thing in the same orientation as the other module. 
With a new limited access approach, I docked. Another huge thank you for all the tidbits that made it possible. The last container went up and docked within two orbits and no contract completion alert. That's right, I forgot the antenna. I guess tonight's mission is to put up a proper solar array and an antenna. I'm already 10k funds over budget on this contract, but that's not the point. I had so much fun and sense of reward from achieving it. Also, it made me ponder what the conversations must have been like at NASA in the 60s about having to do it for the first time. It leaves me in awe of the past and looking to the future. Willing SpaceX and others to do what the masses think is impossible. Homer to your mobile. Right, well, thank you again, Stephen D. And I think that is all of our text letters now. Am I correct? Uh, I, that's all that I have. So let's move on to our first audio letter, and it is from Mittenpo. Okay. All systems are ready. Main engine commission. SRD will be mission and left off. Hello, Wilson. I am a big fan of you. KSP to console. Woohoo! Or should I say, woohoo! I don't own a PlayStation 4. I don't have any plan for buying one. When Biff mentioned in the last episode, I wonder if it comes to PlayStation Vita. I thought it would might be interesting, just maybe. I often go to business trips. But I'm pretty sick of bringing around my heavy laptop just to enjoy cable space program. Since I don't got so much time while moving or taking sandwich breaks, I only do stuff like experimenting things inside the vehicle assembly building VAB and space brain hunger SPH. There is no time for a long missions or contracts. In the past months, I've not been in space. Just driving around the space center with my experimental Duna rover. But when I only got like 5 minutes while waiting for a train, I don't even have the time to launch a game. So I humbly, humbly ask the developers at Squad to make an iOS or Android app called Kerbal R&D Portable. I would love to have an app that would let me create something and test it on a specific biome or a place without needing to bring it all the way there. Say that I make a rover and want to see how it would behave on a Duna surface and the app let me choose locations from a drop down menu. Test vehicle, planet Duna, biome, highland, start. Immediately. I'm on a very simple 3D vector graphics, semi-believable polygon landscape, like in the old car games from the 90s. Yes, testing grounds can be so minimalistic as possible. No need for funky trees and rocks scattered around. No, when I'm satisfied with my creation, I can just save it to the cloud storage and later import it to my desktop computer at home. This could open a new world for the Kerbal Lovers. I'm not a developer and have no skills for programming, so it would be really nice if we could do some R&D research and development, creating new parts, engines, wings, etc. inside the app. Sharing it with the Kerbal community would also be awesome. I would love to do some tweaks to the stock rocket engines. After all, it's our own space program. I don't have any objection for PlayStation 4 Kerbal because I simply don't care. But I would certainly buy the portable tablet version. Let me know what you guys think. I am very sorry for my Japanese accent. Arigatouzaimashita. Mitampo. Right, well... Wow, that is a, I think that's the highest production value audio letter I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, certainly way better than uh, my episodes of Fight Fundamentals. And is it just me, or do you think Mitten Poe is an actual Kerbal? Uh, perhaps, perhaps not. Uh, perhaps but I not. Definitely think that, <laughs> but I definitely think that Mitten Poe 
does bring up uh, an interesting idea to have yeah. an app that, that lets you uh, do things like a, like a testing program outside of their actual game, but that would let you import it. That would be really cool. I'm just not sure how, how feasible it would be and uh, if Squad would be able to do something like that. If, if it managed to work out, if it managed to work out, it would be awesome. I would love something like that. Because I've got an iPad, I would love to be able to have like um, sort of a portable VAB and be able to play with parts when I'm on the move, when I'm just not wanting to boot up Kerbal or I'm angry with it for, you know, not loading properly. Just be able to build things, tweak things. And and especially if you cross that with Kerbal Engineer so you could get your Delta Vs and different biomes and all those extra readouts. That I I don't think it's going to happen. But I think it would be an absolutely wonderful thing. Mitten Power Race is a really good dream yeah. wish. Yeah, I would definitely agree. If if only such a thing would come to pass. Who knows? We yeah. might be both proven wrong at some point. Do you know what really made me laugh in that letter though? And this has to what? be this has to be the best opinion on Kerbal on the PS4, what Mitten Power said. Um I don't have any problem with KSP coming to the PS4 because I simply don't care. There you <laughs> that go. Is, in, that is in... absolutely <laughs> the best way of looking at that, I think. I don't care. I'm happy. Let's move on. <laughs> Pretty much. And uh, I think you have the next audio letter. Yes. And the next audio letter comes from now. I don't know what to call him. Do we call him Caffeine Rage? Do we call him Velvety Smooth? Or Blanket? Everything seems to be some sort of blankety blank, doesn't it? So... But oh, I suppose so. His voice, yeah. Well, what do you prefer, caffeine rage or velvety smooth? Uh, well, considering that it's what he calls himself, I would go with caffeine rage. Okay, caffeine rage, velvety smooth, blankety blank. Let's have a listen to what he's got to say. Greetings, guys. Caffeine rage here, and just wow. I think that's a. About the best way to sum up my feelings about the song that was at the end of the last episode was just, wow. You were joking about Sucker Punches earlier in the episode, and I don't think I could have seen that song coming with a crystal ball, let alone have any idea what I was starting with my previous letter. It was just amazing. I think that's the best way to put it. And I'm not sure if you guys put it together yourselves or you had someone else do it, but <laughs> bravo to them. <laughs> I'm just flabbergasted by it. I still don't know what to say, and it's been well over a day since I listened to it, and I've tried recording this several times, and I'm still just at a loss for words about what to say about it. I'm just amazed. I guess that's the best way to put it. <laughs> I'm um, sorry I'm not able to articulate it a bit better. But I do have another reason for writing in. It is that you brought up science mode. And you wanted to know listeners' feedback, and well, here I am. Even though I'm not sure if I really need encouragement at this point, or more encouragement, I should say. I've always viewed science mode as sort of training wheels, even though it's probably not the best way of putting it. For the entire game, but especially career mode, simply because you're dealing with less stuff, but still have the limitations that you could ease into things. I think NOS is probably the best example of this, uh, indirectly of course, is that going from career to sandbox mode, having him just overwhelmed by all the parts. Imagine if you hadn't gone into career mode at all and you're just jumping into sandbox mode. Just an amazing amount of stuff to sort through to try to figure out what to do. So I think Science Wood really feels its niche just as almost a way to start the game. That said, I'm not entirely convinced that Science Mode needs to stick around in its current form. Simply because Career Mode outshines it so much and the way that the game actually builds its save files is that going between Science, Career, and even Sandbox is literally just turning on and off different modules in the save files to the point that you could actually create your own custom game modes just by mixing and matching the modules. A YouTuber I watch actually is running Sandbox mode, essentially, but he's turned on the module for at least the Kerbal experience. So his pilots are leveling up. They have to 
actually fly missions to get their five star rating instead of just dropping into sandbox mode and having all five star Kerbals. It's an interesting way of doing things, and I think it would be an interesting way for Squad to build a new game mode is allow us to turn on and off the modules individually instead of just having the three presets of everything off, which is essentially sandbox. The science module turned on, and I think that's all that science has. Maybe has the upgradable buildings. I can't remember that well. I don't really play science mode. And then all the modules turned on for, of course, career mode. I think it's a more interesting way of doing it, at least in my opinion. And that's just about it for (laughs) this time. I'm still, like I said, a little bit flabbergasted, even though I did, I I was able to rattle on a bit for about science mode. (laughs) Oh, I'll try to do better next time. Yeah, this has been Caffeine Rage, the remixed. <laughs> and I'll talk to you next time. Oh, I, I, I just love his voice so much. <laughs> I could just listen to that accent for, and um, the accent and the, you know, the low, baritone, smooth voice for ages. It's just mesmerizing, isn't it? We definitely need to get DK and have them have, like, <laughs> a rap off or something a rap a, an epic kerbal rap battle with between dk a rap and, battle. and and velvety smooth velvety smooth caffeine rage and dk oh can you imagine the conversation oh that's like things dreams are made of anyway on to what he was saying uh it actually comes back to what i was saying earlier and that's exactly the point i was making um Essentially, science mode is Korea with bits turned off, isn't it? I know you disagreed with me when you said um, that essentially they're the same thing and they don't need the science mode. Uh, and they do need the science mode, you think. But they are, aren't they? they? Science mode is just Korea with things turned off. And essentially they are, just with different presets. In 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 a way, you are right. But I think that the, the specific set the way the science mode is set up is still valuable and that players myself included still like and find value in that as a mode um i know that before point uh before 1.0 came out when like all of the buildings needed a lot more funds to upgrade i found myself playing science mode more than career mode just because i didn't want to do grindy funds missions in order to unlock things that I needed to progress any further. So I th- I still think that it has value there. So you think that um, science mode is the best place to start for new players, right? Yes, I do still think that. Okay, so in that case, what would you say if science mode and sandbox were the only two options and by playing sandbox you, sandbox, you had to unlock career mode? Um, I also don't like hiding things behind unlocks like that, like whole game modes behind unlocks like that, but I suppose that something like that could work. I I like the way that Kerbal is set up in that it's very do what you want, how you want to do it, in whatever mode you want to do it in. I think that's something that's really good going for it, and I wouldn't want to screw with that. Okay, so you think um, it's fine the way it is with three levels and just entry oh how about like entry mode intermediate mode and advanced mode then where entry is science intermediate is obviously choosing whatever but if these if they labeled it or scaled it like that it might be clearer that this is for the more confident or optimistic players this is for the more so then you don't get a sense of if you jump straight into sandbox oh dear what are all these parts i don't know what's going on what do i do you know well, I don't think that sandbox is is that much harder or career mode is that much harder than sandbox that they deserve, you know, beginner, intermediate and expert modes. What I might do is in the description for science mode, uh when you're going to select a new game, maybe put a little sentence at the end saying recommended for new players. I know obviously oh, that yeah. squ- that squad that squad has that power um and it's up to them but if it were up to me i would i would just put that little line under the science mode description and have that be it that would be the only change i would make 
that that could work a lot better then because then you don't have to it, it's not expecting new players to go into meddle with settings to figure out what is easy for them what's no that I, I think that would be a really good idea there you go fake nas you've got your first million dollar idea <laughs> excellent I, ex- I expect payments by tuesday um <laughs> and we have one more audio letter and it is from carmescence hello bifam nas I'm Carlos, or Carmeste, if you can say so. Well, I waited a couple of letters, but I will repeat the same. Love the show, thank you for what you're doing, really. I also love Amy's recuperation from last show, and made me remember something I never told you. Singing Happy Birthday to yourself, it's really spicy. Curiosity, the Mars rovers, does to itself every year. Well, no, I need to ask for help. I set up a Linux installation only to get lots of mods, starting by real solar system and the realism of Howl, and I really need help with this. May a blade throw shield is useless. Every capsule will explode in the beginning of the dozen, even staking lots of blade will not help. Which mod or setting edit I'm missing here? And maybe this week is too late, but I also have my two cents about PlayStation version. First, I thought it will take love away from the PC version, but after hearing last week's thoughts, it really made me change my mind. A. Maybe Squad will be forced to take care of multi-core and better mode stability. That thing really changed my mind completely. After all, they're developing for Unity, not for PC. Again, thank you for the podcast, and you're absolutely allowed to laugh about my pronunciation. Maybe it will make him improve. Mother to your mobile. Do you know what? Kerbalcast really has a global community, doesn't it? We have listeners from everywhere. I was just thinking that. We now have representatives from both uh, what, American Samoa, uh, the United States, Mexico... Uh, Japan, all over Europe. It's it's kind of crazy. Hey, 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 aren't you missing one there? Who is your co-host, Fake Nos? Are you missing a country? I said all over Europe. Oh, okay, well, I'll let you off then. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, back to... Oh, it, it wasn't Carmessence, you got it wrong, Fake Nos. It was, it was Carmessa. Carmessa. Well, or... I... Yeah, I I added in the N. I'm sorry. Uh, I suppose I'm fulfilling my role as fake nos by mispronouncing names and words. So, living up to your reputation, fake nos. Anyway, um, onto what he was actually saying. Um, that one's for you, I think. The first one. What what would you have to say to that then? Him exploding. Uh, well, I don't, I don't use the real solar system or the rescale mods. I have heard of them affecting the way that heat works i can't i can't really give you any uh any advice there unfortunately um the only thing that i can say is that i didn't hear you mention it but if you are using deadly reentry, at least as of the last time that i tre- checked uh i would uninstall deadly reentry because since 1.0.4 was released they totally up up yeah. They totally updated the way that heat works and actually incorporated a lot of the deadly reentry mechanics. And so I think that that mod, while it may not be totally obsolete, I know that Star Washer is planning on updating it. I think that it might mess with the way heat works if you happen to have both 1.0.4 and deadly reentry installed. Um, unfortunately, I can't give you any advice with real solar system and running out of a blader um, because I don't have any experience with that. Um, you can try the forums. I know that that's kind of a cop-out way of saying I don't know, <laughs> but unfortunately I don't. We have a good community, though, where you can actually go to forums for help and you know you generally do get help there. Uh, yeah, so maybe maybe try the real solar system thread um, on on uh, the mods forum, and who knows, you might get lucky. 
And on to the second point you made about the PlayStation 4. He was... I, I really don't think they're going to have um, mods on the PlayStation 4 version, so I think that's a moot point. I would be very surprised if they did. But what what do you reckon about what he said about forcing Squad to take care of multicore? Uh, I admit that I'm not a total expert on the technical side of, you know, they're develop like he said that they're developing for Unity, not the PC. Um, like I know that Unity is a game engine. I don't I don't know if it. W- functions differently on a ps4 versus a pc um but i think it wasn't it caffeine rage last week uh in his letter talk about this um you know how how it would be of benefit uh so unfortunately i don't really have much to add to that other than i think caffeine rage had more information as far as mods go i do think that there's a chance given what uh bethesda announced about fallout but uh, I think that it's all kind of a long shot as far as mods on the PS4 goes. But then again, that's total speculation on my part. And going back to what Mitten Post says, anyone who, you know, isn't too fussed, they don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you don't have to care. If you're happy with what you've got, you don't have to care. <laughs> okay, um, does that do it for Mission Briefing? Uh, I think that does. I don't have any more letters. Okay. Oh, and fake NOS. Fake NOS. What time is it, fake NOS? I think it might be time for the tweets. Do do time for the tweets. Do do time for the tweets. Oh, <laughs> that's right, I'm fantastic. Sorry. I'm sorry, no, everybody. No, no, no. <laughs> Real NOS right. would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see next week, I suppose. Anyway, Alex Boyd. You need to upgrade both the tracking station and mission control to get maneuver nodes. Ren's loin. Biff, if you want to level up a Kerbal beyond one star, send them on missions to other spheres of influence. Min, the Mun, Minmus, Duna, dot dot dot. Thomas Sturm. In latest episode, Biff said he cares more about Kerbals. Try Final, Mo- F- yeah. Try Final Frontier mod to add more career details to each Kerbal. Haywood Floyd. How about a caffeine rage naming contest? My entry is Captain Velour. Lanyard seventy three regarding the latest episode of Flight Fundamentals. Oh, Fritas, you broke my brain. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. It's supposed to be informative, but as I said on Twitter, I could have taught you calculus instead, so I held back. JD Rock says science is great in its own right. I I have three totally different playstyles for the game modes. Great to choose based on my mood. Uh, Carments, I want to introduce my brother to the game, but I think career is too punishing and sandbox overwhelming. Leave science. Uh, Cajun Nerd, let it be known, July 2nd, 2015, with a glass of Jack Daniels single barrel, I just made my first LKO Kerbal Rescue. Wish I had video. Woo. And finally, Akinesis Gaming, how about decaffeinated serenity for caffeine rage? Uh, man, that's anything. fast to read those as fast as you can. Well, well done. And fake <laughs> Nos, fake Nos, what time isn't it? It's not time for the tweets. Do, do, it's not time for the tweets anymore. Brilliant. I think that's brilliant. And I think that's a perfect <laughs> time to seg into your very special Fritos Flight Fundamentals live. Yes, so for the second time I have to do this off the top of my head and not have a nice script to read and be able to edit out all of my pauses and ums and when I don't know what I'm going to talk about next. So, uh, as I hinted earlier in uh, in the Kerbalcast, uh, today we are going to be talking about space shuttles. Those of you that have been watching me on Twitch know that that's been mostly what I've been doing when I haven't been playing with sharks over the past uh, few weeks, and I wanted to make sure that I got it functional and in a way that I liked it before I talked about it on here. And before I begin, I do want to caveat by saying I wasn't able to figure out a workaround for the the heat bug that I was encountering. Um, I don't know what it was, if it was caused by the big Mark III cargo bay, um, or if it had something to do with the tricoupler that I was using for the shuttle main engines, 
uh, but I would, on physics load, on deploying or stowing the landing gear, and on opening or closing the cargo bay, uh, random parts, usually the tricoupler that I was using to attach the main engines to the back of the shuttle, would explode due to suddenly gaining thousands of degrees of heat for no reason. So uh, using quite a few quick saves, I was able to fly an entire mission successfully with my shuttle. So I'm going to talk about it, but buyer, be buyer beware uh, that it might be a total buggy mess uh, if they haven't fixed that. Hopefully in the next update uh, it'll work. I couldn't trace it to any mods, uh, and I think that uh, Dos Valdez was having some trouble with something like that as well. Um, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, to start for real, uh, as I was saying earlier again, building a lifelike space shuttle replicant that is able to carry cargo to low carbon orbit to sort of simulate the actual space shuttle is one of the most difficult things that I've heard people try and do in Kerbal Space Program. And it was actually the very first thing that Biff ever saw me do playing KSP. And that's why I'm here today with my section on Fight Fundamentals, was because he was uh, quite surprised and not able to believe that my .90 version of the space shuttle was able to fly. And I'll get into the reasons why for uh, in a little bit. But those of you that are unaware, the space shuttle has four main sort of stages in its mission profile. Off of the launch pad, it engages its main engines, which is on the shuttle itself, as well as two big SRBs that are on the sides of the fuel tank, that orange fuel tank on the real shuttle. Uh, because of the way the, the Mark III parts are scaled in KSP, I end up using the really big SLS parts for the central fuel tank, and I actually use four of the big, the biggest size SRBs bundled in a barrel with um, the quad coupler, the um, the two and a half meter quad coupler to connect them all to sort of make a hybrid SRB, and that's what I stick on the side of the uh, the main engine. To ha or the main fuel tank, sorry. Um, so that in the first stage, off of the launch pad, you engage both the three main engines on the shuttle and the SRBs. And what you'll notice is there isn't any, there isn't an engine underneath the fuel tank. That big orange fuel tank in the real shuttle drains all of its fuel into the shuttle orbiter which is the part that lands and, and feeds the fuel through those three engine bells. This means that the thrust isn't through the center of mass from any of those three engines uh, or the two SRBs. So the reason that building a space shuttle is so difficult is because you have to get the balance right with the center of mass, the center of thrust, and as you fly, uh, the center of mass will change as you burn fuel. So what you end up having to do is tip the three uh, the three main engines on the shuttle. You have to rotate them outward a little bit so that they point um, away from the away from the main engine, uh, the main fuel tank. See, this is what you get for having it live. Uh, you have to point them away from the main tank uh, in order so that their their thrust vector goes through the center of mass. If you can manage to get off of the pad and burn off your uh, SRBs without flipping out of control, if you can jettison them away, then imagine that you're left with normal shuttle orbiter, which looks like a space plane, but it has this big, huge tank that's half full of fuel on its belly that you have to be able to fly with that uh, attached to you, and you generally end up turning over backwards um, as you do your gravity turn. You you have it so that the the thrust vector you're kind of balancing the center of mass on top of the engines 
as it uh, as you turn backwards. Uh, once you get past, uh, it, once you get into the uh, out of the atmosphere, then you can jettison the main fuel tank if you can make it that far, uh, and you're left with just the orbiter. But remember what I said that the orbiter itself doesn't carry any liquid fuel. In order to circularize your orbit and do any orbital maneuvers, say go, go to your space station to deliver your payload, the real shuttle uses what they call the orbital maneuvering system, which actually uses monopropellant. And those are those two smaller engines that are on either side of the tailplane on the shuttle. And uh, the way that I like to model that in Kerbal Space Program is with, first of all, I put some enough monopropellant on the actual orbiter so that I'd be able to fly around with it, but then put uh, the smaller 1.25 meter RCS monoprop tanks on the sides and put a cluster of about nine of the RCS engines that you can control with throttle on there to sort of mimic that same function. And if you can get that you have to play a little bit again with getting the center of mass and the center of uh, thrust to work correctly. But if you can get that, then you can sort of mimic the orbital maneuvering system in order to deliver your payload. Uh, of course, that means that in order for the shuttle to be useful, you have to have a payload. And a big tip when you're designing is I like to work backwards. So start with just the shuttle, just the orbiter. Don't put any payload in it. Don't attach the fuel tanks. Don't attach the SRBs. Uh, if you can f get off the runway on just the, the monopropellant engines, see if you can fly around, see if it's aerodynamically stable, and then you can start slowly working your way backwards in the flight, in the flight profile. So you're going to have to add in the whatever your uh, whatever your car, uh, payload is, see if your center of mass doesn't change enough that you can still use the orbital maneuver system. Check. Then add on that big fuel tank, that big external fuel tank. Tip it upright and put it on the launch pad and see if you can fly, and, but only fill it about halfway. Then see if you can fly with that big external tank on your stomach with your engine's tipped by about 15 or 20 degrees or so. And then if that works, then you can fill the main fuel tank and add on the solid rocket boosters and see if you can fly a full, a full profile. It's a very complicated thing to do. Uh, I, if you're having trouble with it, don't worry about it. Uh, it'll take a lot of practice, a lot of trial and error. Uh, if I can get it so that the bugs aren't causing explosions all the time on my version, then if you catch me on Twitch, I'll hopefully be able to use it a lot um, as my main workhorse for setting things into uh, low carbon orbit. So I'll be happy to show you in more detail in a sort of visual medium and also uh, not me just kind of rambling like I am now, uh, how it works. And you can also always cheat a little bit. If you put an engine on the bottom of the main fuel tank, you lose a little bit of the realism that I like to try and go for when making a shuttle, but it makes it much easier to balance because then you can try and uh, use the thrust limiters on all of the engines on the ship. You don't have to tilt any of the engines like you do uh, if you don't put an engine on the bottom of the main, uh, the main fuel tank, and you can adjust things as they go. And... Hopefully you'll be able to go uh, get in orbit and have a useful shuttle. And wow, I feel like that was awful. <laughs> no, it, it was fine. It was fine. Don't worry. Uh, see, this this is what this is what I get for having uh, agreeing to come on with Amy and do this live. Uh, <laughs> it's very it's so basically uh, the main points that I want to take that I want you guys to take away from my rambling on space shuttles is. There are a total of five engine engines or engine clusters on the actual orbiter. There are 
I wind up using three main sails for the shuttle's main engines to get enough thrust. Um, and then there are the two RCS engine clusters, the monoprop engine clusters that I use for the orbital maneuvering system. Uh, both have to be tilted a little bit to account for where the center of mass is in your ship. And then you can attach uh, the SRBs, which again, I use four of the uh, 1.25 meter, the biggest SRBs with uh, the quad couplers on the sides as the SRBs. If you can manage to balance the center of mass as it moves, as the fuel drains, as you lose mass by ditching the engines or the main fuel tank, then congratulations, you've done something that it's taken me weeks and weeks to figure out, um, and you should feel proud of yourself. Um, and if you can't, then you can always just slap stuff on the top of the big, big lifting, uh, big lifting rockets and go from there. But it was just something that I wanted to cover a little bit. Uh, I might revisit this in more detail later. Uh, when I have a chance to like write things down and read from a script and record it and edit it and not screw up and have to pause and think as I'm talking. Um, do you have any questions for me, Amy, about space shuttles? Um, space shuttles are a little bit beyond me right now, but I, so I think I'm <laughs> going to do what I usually do with your with your segments and go back and pause and then try something, pause, play, pause, play. You're pretty much my step by step guide through KSP. <laughs> well, that was kind of the goal of this. Um, I just realized that we didn't have a, a tutorial from J. Arthur, but I think he was uh, on vacation this week anyway. Uh, but yeah, when I first started to do Flight Fundamentals, I was really the only uh, tutorial section. DK had Modder's Minute, and Beginner's Minute didn't really count as a uh, actually informative section. It was entertaining, but it wasn't really super informative. Oh, uh, poor real Nos. <laughs> I, I can't, I don't even want to imagine what real Biff was doing. Um, anyway, so I am glad that I'm able to to help you guys out. This, this week's episode might not have been uh, super useful, but at least it gives you an insight as to what I've been doing for the past few weeks. And I can't you believe you me. don't call yourself an advanced player. It took me weeks and weeks to do something. That's <laughs> of, like, head-banging trial and error. It took me, like, two and a half hours straight to try and land my shuttle um, from only, like, a kilometer away from the runway. Because I was going too fast and I had quick saved, and uh, I had put the pair, I had put the drogue chute. Oh, that's something I could, else I can talk about quickly. You can put a if you put a drogue chute on the back of the shuttle like the real shuttle does. Make sure that you align it with your center of mass as well, because I was having a major issue that if I deployed the drogue chute while trying to land, that it would yank my nose into the air because I had it off center. Um, so that would have probably saved me about two and a half hours of time if I wasn't so stubborn and wanting to put that on the runway. Uh, <laughs> but it eventually worked out, and I had an audience, and I got screenshots, and I put it on, on Twitter. So uh, I, can, I can say firmly mission accomplished and go from there. And I think on that note, it's about time to wrap it up. So we want to say thanks to our listeners and regular contributors, and a especially large thank you today for enduring me and Fritos completely ruin the Kerbal cast and ruin Biff and Noss's show. <laughs> uh, we'd also like to thank everyone who sent us letters and audio letters to read this week. I would like to thank the moderators of the Kerbal Space Pro Program and Kerbal Academy subreddits. The music is provided by Professor Soap, and you can find him at professorprofsoap.com. And a very big thank you to Ascalon, who posts episodes every week on YouTube and is coordinating the transcription of old episodes. And I'm sure he's going to have a really difficult time with this one. Yeah, maybe you and I should handle this one, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I uh, dare. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get in contact with the real Biff and Nos, you can feel free to send them an email at kerbalpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow the real Biff and Noss on Twitter at Kerbalcast. You can follow the fake Biff and Noss, aka Amy K and Freetoss, on Twitter at LittleBlue50 for Amy and at Freetoss7 for myself. 
You can also follow Fritas on, Fritos on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Fritos7 and see all his amazing, not advanced, I do in those air quotes, <laughs> adventures he gets up to. Well, thank you, Amy. And you can also subscribe to us on iTunes, and all episodes can be found there and also at kerbalpodcast.libsyn.com. If you'd like to support Kerbalcast, you can do so by going to... Now, I don't want to pronounce this incorrectly, but I cannot remember for the life of me the correct way, so I'm just going to do the fake Biff thing, and I'm just going to say patreon.com slash Kerbalcast. And that's it from us, so until next time... Happy Happy curdling! curdling.